Lately, I've been into the iceberg meme. In case you don't know what it is, it's when you take a popular series or topic and arrange facts and theories about said topic from well-known to obscure. There have been iceberg videos where people would take a certain iceberg meme and then explain everything on the iceberg. I like Lupin the Third. I've been a fan of it for some time now. It's been going on for over 50 years, so there's a lot of media, interesting trivia, and other miscellaneous stuff to make its own iceberg. So when I saw this Loop on the Third iceberg meme on Twitter, I just had to make a video on it. I would like to thank Forbidden Donut for uploading the iceberg meme that their friend Waffleganger made. I added some more entries onto the iceberg for fun. In fact, I added on so much stuff that I had to squeeze in a new level in there. Really, this video is an excuse for me to talk about Lupin the Third again. So grab a submarine because we are about to take a deep dive into the Lupin the Third iceberg. The Castle of Cagliostro. The Castle of Cagliostro is a Lupin the Third movie that came out in 1979. It is the most well-known piece of Lupin media. One of the reasons why is because it was Hayao Miyazaki's first movie. It's a great film, it's like absolute perfection, and it's completely accessible to anyone. Even if you don't know who these characters are, you can still go into it and have a good time. In fact, this was Miyazaki's intent, to make a movie that anyone could watch. This movie is iconic, it's been referenced a lot. I kid you not, Luigi from Cars? Cagliostro reference. John Lasseter, Human Trash? loves this movie. Due to its popularity and accessibility, this was an entry point for a lot of fans, myself included. I saw this movie and I've been in Lupin hell ever since. Lupin the Third, parts 1 to 5. So these reference the mainline anime TV shows. Uh, there's part 1, part 2, part 3, part 4, and part 5. Despite the names, you don't have to watch these in order, it's just their naming scheme. So, parts 1, 2, and 3, completely episodic. You don't have to watch them in order, you can just drop in wherever you want. Part 4 and part 5 have their own self-contained stories, so it would be best to watch the episodes in order when you're watching those two. While I was recording this, we got a teaser for what could be part 6, but then again it could be a, a special or something. Sometimes these shows are referred to by the jacket color Lupin wears instead of their official names. So green jacket, red jacket, pink jacket, and blue jacket. The CGI movie. Lupin the First is the most recent Lupin movie to come out in cinemas, originally releasing in December of 2019. Clips of it were all over the internet when it was first announced, since the 3D animation looked real good, and the character designs were translated very well into 3D, and also like, you know, did something different, like, it's always nice to have some variety in the character designs. Especially Jigen. Oh, a lot of people were talking about Jigen. Oh no, he's hot! Honestly, if you read the letterbox reviews for Lupin the First, so many people are horny for the cast. Steal me away, hat daddy. <laughs> it's been doing well. As I'm recording this, it's currently being considered for an Oscar nomination for Best Animated Feature. Uh, I've heard it's really good. Uh, I'm waiting for it to release in my country because it's very rare for me to actually legally support Lupin the Third in my country. All we have is Cagliostro, guys. Uh, fun fact, Mars Animation Planet, the studio that animated this movie, was formed through SEGA. So they have been animating Sonic the Hedgehog cutscene since 2008. So there is a Lupin Sonic connection there, and now you know about it. Oh, that actually explains the Puyo Puyo promotional crossover from 2019, because the first was in production at the time, and Puyo Puyo belongs to SEGA. Hey, edit update. It turns out that SEGA and TMS are a part of the SEGA Sammy holding company. In 2005, shortly after Sonic X ended, which TMS animated, SEGA Sammy acquired 50% of TMS. In 2012, they owned all of TMS, and it became a subsidiary of SEGA. 
And in 2017, Mars' studio planet became a subsidiary of TMS. So the connection was bigger than I thought. Okay, back to the video. The Woman Called Fujiko Mine. The Woman Called Fujiko Mine is a spin-off miniseries that focuses on Fujiko as the lead. It's a prequel taking place before part one, so some of it is about the characters meeting each other for the first time. It's one of the more darker pieces of Lupin media with nudity, violence, and covering heavy topics such as child abuse. It is the first and currently only Lupin show directed by a woman. I recommend it, it's really good, it has a really good art style, the story is engaging, obviously because of the heavy themes I mentioned, it might not be for everyone, but I would highly recommend it. Takeshi Koke spin-off films After the popularity of The Woman Called Fuchiko Mine, the character designer and animation director of that show, Takeshi Koke, started making films in a similar style and tone. Each film focuses on one of the main characters other than Lupin. So Jigen with Jigen's Gravestone, Goemon with Goemon's Blood Spray, and Fujiko with Fujiko's Lie. At one point, we'll be getting one with Senigata as the lead. Compared to the Fujiko miniseries, these movies are kinda horny, especially that one scene in Jigen's Gravestone. If you've seen it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Lupin out of context. There are a lot of YouTube videos with clips from the show out of context. Goemon Ishikawa is in the house! <laughs> there are also social media accounts that post images and clips out of context. Monkey Punch. Monkey Punch is a manga artist and the creator of Lupin the Third. He created the character in 1967 with the original manga. When it comes to the anime, he directed one of the movies and an anniversary special. Otherwise, he gave the animators the freedom to do whatever they wanted. He's done other stuff as well. He has written other manga. He has illustrated album covers for the soundtracks of the anime series. He did the Japanese cover of Crackdown because Microsoft was desperate to get a Japanese audience. Before he passed away in 2019, one of the last things he did was DC illustrations to promote Shazam. Not the only Lupin DC connection. Yellow Fiat 500. This is the car that Lupin and the gang normally drive throughout the series. It's also a real car. In fact, the Fiat was based off of the late Yasu Atsuka's car. And the Citroen that Clarice drives in Cagliostro was based off of Miyazaki's car. Now that we are done with level 1, we must go into the water. The Mystery of Mamo The Mystery of Mamo is a loop on the third movie that came out in 1987, and it is the first animated film in the series. Lupin is up against Mamo, this little gremlin man who makes clones. While it's one of the more well-known and iconic pieces of Lupin media, not many people have seen it. That's why it's on level 2. Which is a shame. It's completely bonkers, and the animation can be really pretty at times. There's this one scene where Lupin's walking around Mamo's lair, and he just ends up in recreations of famous paintings. It also has one of the most intense tree-legged races in cinematic history. If you've only seen Cagliostro, prepare for some tonal whiplash. This is not the heroic Lupin you're used to. And content warning, Lupin attempts to sexually assault Fujiko in one scene. Also, Hitler's there. Why are Nazis such a common occurrence in this franchise? Another interesting thing to note about this movie is, there are four different English dubs for it. One of the dubs changes everyone's names except for Lupin, and Jigen's name is Dan Dunn. And I just think that's funny. His name is the automatopoeia for, for the law and order noise. The manga. Lupin the Third started off as a manga by Monkey Punch. It was meant to run just for three months, but due to its popularity, it kept going. One of the main influences for the art style is Mad Magazine, giving it a more western look compared to other manga at the time. I really do like the art style, it's very expressive and cartoony, and it is interesting to see how Monkey Punch's art changes over time. There's the original run of Lupin the Third that lasted for two years, followed by Shin Lupin the Third, or as it's known in English, Lupin the Third World's Most Wanted. I just want to point out the As Seen on Cartoon Network note here. I do understand that the anime was airing on Adult Swim at the time, and back then Adult Swim didn't have the brand recognition it has now. I just find it funny that Cartoon Network was used to advertise Lupin the Third. 
Just in case you don't know, this manga is not for kids. Let's get back on track. After World's Most Wanted, there was Sexy Lupin the Third, which only ran for five chapters. Then there's Lupin S, Lupin Y, Lupin M, Lupin M Neo, Lupin H, Lupin B, and Lupin T. If you're wondering what the letters mean, they represent the illustrator who is working on that particular manga. Then there's a couple of spin-offs and uh, manga adaptions of the TV show and the movies. A lot of chapters from the manga have been adapted into episodes of the anime. It's tricky to find any English copies of the manga, since only a few volumes were translated by Tokyopop in the early 2000s, and they're currently out of print. So not many people have read it. The manga has a much darker tone compared to the anime. Zenigata says fuck. But seriously, there's a lot of sex and violence, and Lupin's a rapist. I'm not exaggerating here. Throughout the manga, Lupin and other random male characters sexually assault women. Yeah, um, I wouldn't recommend the manga to everyone because of this recurring element. Also, some English translations use the R word, so look out for that. On a scale of 1 to 10 on how nice or mean Lupin is, Cagliostro is a 1 and the manga is a 10. Those are the extremes. Every other adaption is a scale in between those two. Sometimes you can tell what kind of Lupin you're getting into by looking at the character design. Oh no. Baby boy. Baby. Looks like, looks like a baby to me. Yeah. Uh, evil. The series is a fan fiction of Maurice LeBlanc's novels. Monkey Punch was a fan of Arsene Lupin, The Gentleman Thief which was a series of novels written by Maurice LeBlanc. Inspired by these novels, he created Lupin to be the grandson of Arsène Lupin, thus the name Lupin III. The Maurice LeBlanc estate were not happy with this, since Monkey Punch did not ask permission to use the Lupin name. This had led to a lot of copyright issues for years. At the time, Japan did not enforce trade copyright, so the character could exist in Japan. But outside of Japan, the character had to be renamed. For example, in English, they used Rupon or Wolf in some of the dubs. Some of the dubs had Jigen refer to Lupon as Boss to avoid mentioning his actual name. Boss? Boss? Ooh, boss? Okay, Boss? Right, Boss. What's up, Boss? Boss? What? Oh, boss? Fuck off. Oh, boss? Hey, Boss? The boss? Boss? How you doing, Boss? You really boss? Boss? You a boss? You boss? Boss? What do you think? In Germany, he was called Hardy Man. That's a terrible name. Arsene Lupin has since entered the public domain. It's no longer an issue. But for a while, Lupin III was unauthorized fanfic. It's ironic since LeBlanc himself dealt with copyright issues with Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, with his novel Lupin vs. Sherlock Holmes. LeBlanc had to rename Sherlock into Herlock Sholmes to avoid a lawsuit. Herlock Sholmes! Good day, gentlemen. Herlock Schlomes is a great name. Popularity in Italy. It's really popular in Italy. Ever since the 70s, they somehow avoided copyright issues. I don't know how. Here's some examples to give you an idea of how Italians love this series. Part 4 takes place in Italy, and premiered in Italy six months before Japan. There is a Lupin shop in Milano. Last year there was a drug bust, and the people who were arrested we're wearing Lupin, Jigen, and Goemon masks. These masks will haunt my dreams, they are horrifying. Monkey Punch met a manga that's exclusive to Italy. Italians have made their own officially licensed comic books, Yuji Ono. Yuji Ono is a jazz musician who has been the composer for Lupin III ever since Part 2, and composes for almost every movie, TV show, and special ever since. He is a part of two groups, You and the Explosion Band, as well as the Lupin Tick 6. Both groups have also worked on Lupin. Ono is one of my favorite composers. His music is either bombastic and exciting, or super chill. Check out some of his original work if you have the time. Cosmos is a personal favorite. And if you don't have the time to listen to an album, just listen to Space Kid. It's so upbeat and happy, it's a good time. Everything he composes is gold. Which is why I recommend watching the sub for part 4. Why? 
Well, there are two versions of Part 4. Since Part 4 premiered in Italy months before Japan, there are differences between the Italian version and the Japanese version. The Japanese version has different openings and endings, some animation tweaks to fix errors from the Italian version, and a soundtrack by Yuji Ono. The Italian version has its own unique soundtrack, and its opening uses a rap song, which is really bad. Like, almost One Piece levels bad. So the English dub used the Italian version, since it came out first. They kept the Italian soundtrack, but don't worry, they replaced the rap with an instrumental jazz number. It's pretty good. It sounds like a Mario Kart song, though. So because of these reasons, I would recommend watching the Japanese version, mainly for Yuji Ono's soundtrack. Normally I don't care about sub versus dub, but this is one of my few exceptions. The Lupin Pilot After the popularity of the manga, a pilot was created in 1969 to pitch a possible TV series. It's a 12 minute short that acts as an introduction to the characters, including Kagoro Akechi, a character from the first chapter of the manga, and this pilot, and nothing else. The pilot includes one of the most iconic shots in the franchise, that gets referenced not only by other pieces of Lupin media, but by other anime. The pilot would eventually lead to the creation of part 1, which reuses some of the animation for its opening. This is unworthy of my blade. This is Goemon's catchphrase, but he doesn't really say it that often. This is unworthy of my blade. Sometimes it's translated to, once again, I've cut a worthless object. Some dubs replace the line with a joke. Should have worn an asbestos suit. Oh, I like the streamlined dub for nostalgic reasons, but it's not good, you guys. There is no canon. Loop on the Third works on negative continuity, like The Simpsons or Scooby Doo. Trying to make a canonical timeline is almost impossible, and you will go insane. It makes no damn sense. It compels me though. At least two different men have taught Jigen how to shoot a gun. And I think there's more, but I can't think of them right now. Goemon can drive cars and planes in part 2, but in part 4 and 5 he can't drive a car. Other than the main cast, it's extremely rare for other characters to come back. I'm surprised Yata showed up in anything other than part 5. I thought they were going to forget about him like all the other one-off Zenigata partners. Like Vicky Flanagan. Does anyone remember him? Characters, birthdays. In a Castle of Cagliostro art book, there's a page that lists birthdays and horoscopes for the characters. So far, this is the only time dates of birthdays have been mentioned. Except for in Bye Bye Liberty, where a card reveals that Zenigata's birthday is Christmas, but as I mentioned a moment ago, there is no canon. So for some fans, these are considered official birthdays. If you want to check out the horoscopes, Jigen Daisuke on Tumblr has translated them. I'll link them below. Cagliostro takes place in 1968. In one scene in Cagliostro, there's a newspaper that's dated as 1968. So that's the year the movie takes place in. Jigen in Western cartoons. This refers to Jigen making cameos in a few cartoons. Here's some examples. In Samurai Jack, there's a character called Thief. He appears in one episode, Jack and the Labyrinth. He also appeared in one of the IDW comic books. If you just look at him, it's, it's Jigen. The character's personality is more like Lupin, and the whole episode was meant to be a Lupin the Third tribute. In another episode, they reference Cagliostro. That's it. The crystal of Cagliostro. In the DuckTales reboot, here's Jigen in the Fiat 500. In another episode, Lupin makes a cameo. In the 90s TMS animated episodes of American cartoons, for example, Batman the Animated Series, Tiny Toon Adventures, The Real Ghostbusters, and Animaniacs. In one episode of Animaniacs, Sir Yaxalot, the animators at TMS snuck in Jigen on a cart. That's all I know when it comes to Jigen in Western cartoons. 
There are tons of cameos in anime. Kazuhiku Kato. This is Monkey Punch's actual name. Monkey Punch is just a pen name that was given to him by his editor. Kato was not a fan of the name, but it stuck. There are multiple Fujikos. Originally in the manga, Fujiko was a different woman in each chapter. They were just all called Fujiko for some reason. And each week, these women all had their own different motivations because they were different women. Coming up with a new character for almost every chapter was proving difficult, so eventually, she just became the one character. Superhero, alternative version. Superhero is a song from the anime. The original version had English vocals, and it would play sometimes in episodes of part 2. Normally, it goes like this. I'm the one everybody's waiting for. But there's an alternate version of the song with completely different lyrics, which sounds like this. Here I am, girls are melting in their shoes. Scream and faint, wanting me because I'm cool. They need somebody, someone at least as cool as me. I actually did not know about this until starting this video. This feels like I stepped into an alternate universe because I'm just so used to the original. Is Lupin burning? This is the first episode of part one, so this is the first official episode of the entire series. It's also a part of history. You see, Lupin the Third part one is the first ever anime to be made for an adult audience. So as far as I know, this is the first episode of an adult cartoon. It's an interesting watch if you're curious, um, but there is a scene where Fujiko is strapped to a tickle machine. Yeah, it's really weird. This wouldn't be the only time the Lupin anime would make history. The 99th episode of part 2 was the first ever anime to use stereo sound. Isn't that a neat fact? Who wants chicken nuggets? This is a line from the English dub of part 2. Who wants chicken nuggets? Jigen is based off of James Coburn. Monkey Punch has stated that Jigen was inspired by the actor James Coburn, especially his role as Brit from The Magnificent Seven. Brit is a character who wears a hat, who's quiet and calm in most situations, and can throw his knife with pinpoint accuracy. Ironically, Brit is terrible with a gun. That, that was the greatest shot I've ever seen. The worst. I was aiming at the horse. Interesting fact. Kiyoshi Kobayashi, Jigen's voice actor, was also the voice actor who dubbed a lot of James Coburn's roles into Japanese. Lupin the Third Jr. Monkey Punch met a short-lived manga spin-off about Lupin's son. This character did originally show up in one of the chapters of the original manga. And oh hey, he's kind of referencing the whole multiple Fujiko things, isn't that interesting? Led Zeppelin in the part 1 opening. In the opening for part 1, there is a brief moment where Fujiko is dancing in front of flashing images. And oh look, there's images of Led Zeppelin! Oh god, I, I did French in secondary school, but I'm really bad at pronouncing it. Edgar de la Creme Brulee. <sighs> It's not a creme brulee! <laughs> I'm so sorry, you guys. Due to copyright issues I mentioned earlier, in France, Lupin was renamed to Edgar de la Creme Brulee. The theme song is funny since it's completely different to what you would expect from a Lupin third show. I kind of like it though. Fuchiko's voice actor sings Part 5's ending. Miyuki Sarashiro, the current voice actress for Fujiko, 
sings the ending theme to part 5. With her singing it and Fujiko heavily featuring in the credits, this led to a lot of speculation to what this could mean. We now know that it was foreshadowing the reveal that Fujiko and Lupin got married in secret and then later divorced. Goemon was added after Backlash. There's this story going around on the internet that while visiting America, Kato got a complaint from an American that his art wasn't Japanese enough, therefore inspiring him to make Goemon. This story has been proven false, and here's an interview from the man himself on how he created Goemon. あの、well, we're halfway there, but like Leonardo DiCaprio and Elliot Page in Inception, we need to go deeper. Lupin Laserdisc Posters So I'm just going to briefly mention what a Laserdisc is. Tell you the truth, I'm 25 and I didn't know these were a thing till two years ago. So laser discs were an old media format invented in 1978. They even got Leonard Nimoy talking to a plastic rock to promote them. Yes, I can understand you. I'm Leonard Nimoy. Imagine a DVD, but it's as big as a vinyl record. In most places, it was a complete failure. But it did well in Japan. Well enough that Pioneer, a company that made Laserdisc players, ceased production of them in 2009. So there were Laserdisc releases of Lupin III. Part 1 had these nice recreations of scenes from the show. The Part 3 Laserdiscs went with scenes that never happened in the show. Here are some examples. Lupin, Fuchiko, and Jigen are in a band. The gang wrecks Zenigata's car. Goemon is acting in a movie, and Jigen is the director. Everyone's on holiday. Fuchiko and Lupin are at a masquerade. Fuchiko and Lupin are having a date in space. An improv session gone wrong. Zenigata performing a strip show. Good for him. And whatever the hell is going on here, why is Jigen so happy about this? Despite Laserdisc and Lupin not really being that popular in the US at the time, life found a way, since there is an English Laserdisc release of the Fuma Conspiracy. The Laserdiscs for Part 2 were movie poster parodies. I'm gonna name them all for you. Chinatown, The Deadpool, A Clockwork Orange, West Side Story, Ikiru, Lawrence of Arabia, Paper Moon, Gone with the Wind, the Sound of Music, Cleopatra, Jaws, Taxi Driver, Terminator, Seven Samurai, Enter the Dragon, Breakfast at Tiffany's, Westworld, Planet of the Apes, City Lights, Blade Runner, The Sting, Roman Holiday, Fistful of Dollars, Ghostbusters, Shane, Lady Snowblood, Stranger Than Paradise, Bonnie and Clyde, the Blues Brothers, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. This one is a reference to a Japanese film series called Torosan. There are 48 of these movies. I don't know which one this cover refers to, so I chose a random movie. Tootsie, Heaven Can Wait, Badlands, Seven Year Itch, Cannonball Run, The Third Man, Hamlet, and American Graffiti. An interesting thing about these covers is some of them have characters from Part 2. The third man has the ballerina from episode 58, and Paper Moon has the girl from episode 27. There's more examples, but I couldn't remember what episodes they were from. Fujiko's weapon is playing cards, so the main cast have their own weapons. 
Lupin has the Walther P38, Jigen has his Magnum, Goemon has his sword. For Zenigata, it's his handcuffs, but sometimes he holds his cheat, but you don't really see it that often. So Fuchiko's weapon is playing cards. Now, of course, she uses a gun. I'm, I'm not sure if this is a fan theory or if it's actual canon, but there is evidence. In the pilot, she uses a card to stop a knife. She throws cards in an episode of Part 5 and in the 70s live-action movie. In Part 4, when Leonardo da Vinci pulls an inception on the entire population of Italy and tests everyone's skills, for Fujiko, it's a game of cards. And when she wins, she uses them as a weapon. It also kind of fits her character. Her actions and motivations change depending on the situation. Like in a game of cards, it depends on the hand that you're dealt. Loop on the fourth. So there are two loop on the fourths I'm aware of, and I didn't know which one the iceberg was referring to. So I'm going to talk about both. In the anime, Aria the Scarlet Ammo, there is a character named Riko Mine loop on the fourth. She is Fujiko and Lupin's daughter. Other characters are also descendants of other famous characters. There is a Sherlock Holmes one. Then there's the 1990 December issue of Animage, where they had this article of what would anime look like in the 21st century. This included an OVA for 40-year-old anime fans, a magical girl anime by Mamoru Oshii, and a Lupin the Fourth anime series. Cliffhanger. Laser Dick. Laser Dick! <laughs> Laser Disc wasn't just used for movies, it was also used for arcade cabinets. The most famous example being Dragon's Lair. Dragon's Lair was a big deal at the time. You went from this. to this. popularity of Dragon's Lair, Stern Electronics met Cliffhanger, reusing clips from The Castle of Cagliostro and The Mystery of Mamo to make a game. Due to the copyright issues, characters had to be renamed. Lupin is Cliff, Jigen is Jeff, and Goemon is Samurai. The dub is terrible, making it hilarious. Will Count Draco strike the first blow? Will the princess be forced to marry someone she can't stand? Oh, no! Millions! Trillions! It's counterfeit! Some days you just don't want to get out of bed. Cliffhanger has met its mark in media. It even briefly shows up in the Goonies. More people seem to talk about Cliffhanger a lot more than they do Space Ace, the spiritual successor to Dragon's Lair. Lupin is immortal. Like any long-running show, you have the classic Insert character here is immortal. And Loop on the Third is no exception. There are a lot of theories that the main characters are immortal. The series has been going on for a long time. Each anime takes place in what was then modern day. For example, Part 5 has smartphones. So we do have technology advancing as the years go by, and our characters not really aging at all. In fact, Part 2 was made five years after Part 1. And the first episode of part two is the gang getting back together after five years. Like I said earlier, there is no canon. But following that logic, that means that time moves at the same rate as the real world. Some people have used the OVA, Red vs. Green, to support this theory. Uh, there are two scenes with Jigen that sort of imply this. Jigen talks about how he's been using the same gun for 40 years, and in another scene he says, I may be old, but I still got it, despite the fact that he looks the same as he always does. So those two scenes in particular I do see pop up anytime someone has the gang is immortal theory. But this movie was made to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the series, so it's completely up to you how you interpret that. Let, let's move on. Strange Psychokinetic Strategy this is a live-action movie from the 70s. It is the first ever Lupin movie. It predates the mystery of Mamo. It's its own thing. Jigen is older and has a mentor role. Zenigata has two partners that he comedically plays off of. 
Wupon was raised by nuns. There is no Goemon. Fujiko is pretty much just Fujiko. It's an interesting piece of Lupin media that's worth checking out if you're curious. It's just so different to what you would be used to if you were a fan of the anime. It's a gag a minute movie with some funny visuals, kind of like Airplane or Naked Gun or a Touch of Cloth. Any Touch of Cloth fans out there? An entire building full of innocent people dead because of me for the fifth time this year! At some point, there's even a Benny Hill chase scene. Jigen eating a sandwich near a toilet is a complete mood. But yeah, if you're interested and you're looking for a strange movie, go for it. Part 5 Ending Meaning So in the last episode of Part 5, Lupin takes off his face and we don't know what he was hiding underneath. It's a complete mystery. People have tried figuring out what it meant. So here are a couple of theories I've read on the internet. Could Lupin be hiding facial scars from years of working a dangerous job? Is he actually showing signs of aging? Does he have salt and pepper hair or crow's feet? Maybe it has nothing to do with his face. Maybe he wrote something on his forehead, revealing a different kind of secret. It's probably just a reference to the manga. I think it's meant to symbolize that Lupin is whatever you, the viewer, wants him to be. Since before that, Enzio went on a big old speech about Ah ha ha, Lupin, I know everything about you because of my app. It's just, I have so many opinions about part 5. One of them being, it kind of feels like it was written by Stephen Moffat sometimes. Because this ending feels like the Reckenbach falls all over again. We will never know and that's the point. The musical. In Japan, there is an all-female theater group called the, the Takarazuka Review. This group has been around for over a hundred years, and they have made musical adaptions of movies, books, and other media. Examples include The Great Gatsby, Oliver Stone's JFK, Sailor Moon, Phoenix Wright, and of course, Lupin the Third. The story is about the gang trying to steal the Queen's necklace in France. You know, Zenigata shows up, the usual chaos ensues. But then the necklace brings everyone back in time to the 1780s France, just before the French Revolution. So with the help of Cancagliostro, they have to find some items that will allow them to get back to the present. One of these items is in the possession of Marie Antoinette, but Lupin has feelings for her and he might rewrite history to prevent her death from the revolution. The fact that I don't question how crazy this storyline is shows that I've seen so much from this franchise. Goemon was originally black. In the pilot and the mystery of Mamo, Goemon had a much darker skin tone compared to every other depiction of him. It does suck that some of the characters do get lighter skin tones as the years go on. TMS give my boy back his melanin! Yamada replaces Lupin in part 4. So there's this theory that the reason why part 4's characterization felt a little off for some of the characters was because it took place after the events of Red vs. Green, where Lupin was replaced by Yamada, the main character of that movie. In parts 1, 2, and 3, when they're not stealing stuff, the gang tend to hang out with each other, whether that's chilling on the beach, going to plays, or even making dinner together. But in part 4, they talk about how outside of work, they don't really talk to each other. So I can see why this theory is a thing. Inspector Gadget exists because of Lupin the Eighth. Deke Entertainment is a television production company best known for the Super Mario cartoons, dubbing Sailor Moon into English in the 90s, Go bleach your roots, creep! and all these shows. In 1981, Deke formed a partnership with TMS to make the show Ulysses 31. Happy with the success of Ulysses, TMS proposed the idea of making a Lupin III TV show for a younger audience. Space was pretty popular at the time with Star Wars, and with the success of Ulysses 31, 
It was decided that the show would take place in the future, so all the characters are descendants of their original counterparts. We have Lupin the Eighth, Goemon the Eighteenth, Fuchiko the Sixth, Jigen the Sixth, and Zenigata the Sixth. With the target demographic being kids, changes had to be made. Lupin the Eighth is a detective, not a thief. Jigen doesn't smoke, he eats lollipops. Guns have been replaced with lasers, and Goemon's sword is now a lightsaber. Zenigata works for the space ICPO. Since this Lupin isn't a criminal, Zenigata just doesn't trust him because of their family's past. The pilot was made with music, sound effects, and a written script, but the project was cancelled before any dialogue was recorded. Because the Maurice LeBlanc estate came in about copyright. Since the show was being produced in France, there was no way around the whole copyright issues, making the production very difficult. The easiest thing to do was just pull the plug. To recoup the costs of the cancelled show, a new one had to take its place. So they came up with Inspector Gadget. A lot of the animators from TMS that were going to work on the 8th ended up working on Part 3. And TMS was still involved with Inspector Gadget, but only in the animation department. They animated most of the episodes for Season 1. For a long time, the pilot was considered lost media, until it was released on the Lupin Master Collection in 2012. Excluding the pilot, there were five other episodes that were partially animated. Since they were partially animated, the details are a little vague. There's an episode where Lupin fights a fake Lupin. The fake Lupin acts more like Lupin III, so he's stealing things and giving the Eight a bad name. Also, he's a robot. Jigen and Lupin are stealing things, I think? Lupin enters a Formula One car race. Lupin and Jigen are playing American football. Zenigata has a microchip in his teeth, and Lupin disguises himself as a dentist to try and get it. And Fuchiko is also after the microchip. So yeah, Lupin III is responsible for the creation of Inspector Gadget. So if you were like me, and you were watching Lupin III and you thought, you know what this reminds me of, Inspector Gadget? There was a reason why you had those feelings. Lupin and Zenigata dancing in an old commercial. This refers to an ad for watches. Hmm? Oriental? Melody Canadero, Digital Sansei Shintojo, Orient. The Typing Game. No, this isn't some Mavis Beacon style ripoff. In 2001, WoW Entertainment, now known as Sega AM1, made a Loop on the Third arcade light gun game called Loop on the Shooting. It's a two player game where you play as either Lupin and Jigen, and each level is based off of an episode of Part 2 with the final level being based on the mystery of Mama. One small detail that I like is that Lupin and Jigen's guns match the ones from the show, so they have different clip sizes. AM1 also made House of the Dead 2, and both games are a bit similar. Just like how House of the Dead 2 was re-released as a typing game called Typing of the Dead, where you type words to kill the zombies, Lupin the Shooting was re-released as Lupin the Typing. Unlike Typing of the Dead, this game and the arcade version were never released outside of Japan. And Lupin and Jigen don't wear those cool Sega Dreamcast keyboard backpacks, which were Typing of the Dead's in-game explanation for why typing somehow kills zombies. Jigen owns the SSK in the current timeline. In Boat Part 1 and 2 and The Mystery of Momo, Lupin tends to drive a Mercedes-Benz SSK more often than the Fiat. Over time, the Fiat became more common and the SSK kinda just disappeared. Near the end of Part 5, after Lupin is captured, the SSK makes an appearance. Jigen parked it in the middle of the road to stop the prison transport with Lupin in it. This has led to the theory that Jigen now owns the SSK. With the amount of times that Lupin crashed or damaged that car, I wouldn't be surprised if Jigen just took the keys off of him. That car would be really expensive to maintain, considering how old it is. In Japan, Lupin and Kermit have the same voice actor. Yasuo Yamada, the original voice actor for Lupin, did the Japanese dub for Kermit the Frog. Here's a comparison. Link 
それがゴート札の震源地というわけかその筋じゃ有名な伝説さ偽札界のブラックホールってみんなそれを信じている願い込めて He also also dubbed Clint Eastwood and voiced these characters until his death in 1995. To add to this, the original Italian voice actor for Lupin dubbed Miss Piggy in Italian. La squadra locale del Santos giocherà contro gli americani. Sarà una gran festa per i brasiliani così patiti del c a Oh, grazie! E certo, di solito non faccio mai cose così frivole! Oh, sono un'attrice indossatrice io! Toshiko Zenigara. In one scene in The Mystery of Mamo, Someone mentions that Zenigata has a daughter named Toshiko. This character has never been mentioned again in the rest of the series. So basically, he left his family behind. He left his family behind! It reminds me that in one chapter of the manga, Jigen mentions he has a sister, and that too is never ever brought up again. Lupin Sanchi. This is a web parody series by the animator Frogman that has 10 episodes. It was officially released by TMS on Blu ray, though it is no longer on their official website, so I think they don't want to acknowledge that this was a thing anymore. It took me a while to find all 10 episodes, but I eventually found it with no subtitles, so I was mostly lost, especially since a lot of the humor is puns and wordplay. Since it's a web animation, the animation is a bit limited. He's just standing there. Episodes include an Attack on Titan parody, this old man raising Lupin, Jigen, and Fujiko when they were kids, and there's a Titanic reference, and they're aliens now? Also, this is like the only time in Lupin media that I'm aware of that mentions the Lupin flower. You think that'll be brought up more? You know that trope where a kid adopts a wild animal and then they have to let it go, and they're like, Get out of here! I don't want you anymore! You stupid animal! That's an episode, but Lupin's the animal. A My Neighbor Totoro parody. Look, he does the Totoro jump. And Lupin is a teacher. Jigen, Goemon, and Fujiko are barely in it. Jigen and Goemon, especially. Goemon uses his sword once. I did not know that this was a thing until very recently, and now I do. It's very odd. Robot Jigen. This is concept art from the Part 5 art book that has been living in my head rent free for two years now. Another scrapped concept for Part 5 was a scene where the Fiat turns into a mech. They better use these in Part 6. Mankatsu Madness. This is a Monkey Punch miniseries that adapts his other manga into this anthology miniseries. In between segments, there are these fun 30 second Lupin shorts. It, it's very Looney Tunes. Jigen is such a gremlin in this, I love it. Part 2 English Outtakes. The English dub for Part 2 had a couple of outtakes, and they were shown at a convention in 2006. I recommend them, they're pretty funny. It says right here. Dot, 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 dot. <laughs> But, but they're not safe for work. Don't, don't play them at your workplace. Fuma Conspiracy Behind the Scenes. The Fuma Conspiracy is an OVA that came out in 1987. During production, TMS wanted to recapture the magic of Cagliostro. So, Green Jacket, check. Fiat, check. Young girl who pines for one of the lead characters, but he has to leave? Check a Rooney. Now all we need is beautiful animation. So, they threw a lot of money at this project so they could get that pretty animation. And they went a little over budget. They could no longer afford Yuji Ono for the soundtrack or the usual voice cast for the characters. TMS decided to replace them with different voice actors. When the voice actor for Lupin, Yasuo Yamada, found out about this, he was not told who made the decision. And he assumed that Kato might have something to do with it. Over the years working on the TV series, Kato and Yamada had developed a friendship, so for Yamada, this felt like a betrayal. Kato had nothing to do with the decision to change the voice actors, but he did not interfere with TMS's decision, as he felt that he had no place to tell him what to do. The usual voice cast returned to their usual roles with the TV special Bye Bye Liberty, but the damage was done. 
Kato and Yamada's friendship never recovered, and Nyasu Yamada died of a brain hemorrhage in 1995. Manga Lupin is disfigured. It's heavily implied in the manga that Lupin is always wearing a mask, hiding his true face, and Zenigata is determined to see it. I have not read all of the manga, so I might be missing some details on this. The most famous example of this is in a chapter where Zenigata has caught Lupin and tries to unmask him, but he gets away like he always does. This image has shown up a lot online, but I have read this chapter, that isn't the real Lupin, that was a guy impersonating Lupin, and the real Lupin killed him. Lupin and Fujiko in a Hostess Club video game. In 2012, Level 5 met a game called RPG Cinderella Life. It's basically a Hostess Club simulator. If you don't know what a Hostess Club is, they're nightclubs where women would talk to the male customers, giving them company and catering to them, true conversation. They're quite common in Japan. Uh, that's the aim of the game, the player tries to meet the customer's needs and keep them happy. As part of a promotion, there were quite a few anime, manga, and video game characters that would show up as potential customers. This included Tuxedo Mask from Sailor Moon and Kaiji from Gambling Apocalypse Kaiji. Along with these characters, Lupin and Fujiko are also customers. I have found some concept art where the designs for Lupin and Fujiko were a bit different, with the character designs looking more like the manga. This game never released outside of Japan due to low sales and questionable subject matter for a game that was targeted for a young audience. So I don't know what anyone is saying, but yes, this is a thing that happened. Pachinko and Slot Machines Pachinko is really popular in Japan, and there are quite a few Lupin Pachinko machines. Lupin Pachinko machines have a original animation and storylines, and some of the content in them is wild. Like the whole gang pimped out in gold suits. Jigen pouring wine on himself for some reason. Whatever's happening here? There is no straight explanation for this. One of these machines had a character called Zenigata Robo, which was just a gigantic robotic version of Zenigata. Exclusive to that pachinko machine, by the way. And to promote that particular pachinko machine, in 2014, they recreated Zenigata Robo, drove him around through cities of Japan, and it would shout, I'm gonna get you, Lupin! You're just having a normal day and you see this thing. Side note here, I, I really hate this design for Zenigata here. It's mostly the chin, it, it just doesn't look right. It's too far apart. There's also fan service, of course. You want shirtless Zenigata? Here you go. The newest one from last year has this bit with Sexy Jigen splashing himself with water. It's weird that we got Sexy Jigen twice in such a short time. Zenigata blows up a building to save Lupin? You love to see it. Now, I didn't just add this section to the iceberg just to give you this stuff. I mainly meant it for this. So before making the Koke specials, and before being the character designer for the Fujiko miniseries, Takeshi Koke did designs for a slot machine called Fujiko $10 Billion Goddess. You'd think this would be more well known, but I only stumbled upon this information by pure luck. When the trailer for this machine released, some people thought that this was going to be a new TV show. After seeing the trailer, I do not blame them. The art style is very interesting. They're basically the Koke designs that you're familiar with, but it's a lot more bright and cartoony, uh, more in tone to the TV specials at the time. Lupin in the Ace Attorney prototype. In the 15th anniversary Ace Attorney Encyclopedia, there are storyboards that were made for a prototype version of the game, with Lupin on the witness stand. The series creator, Shu Takumi, is a fan of both Arsene Lupin and Lupin III. This makes sense since Gumshoe's design is a bit similar to Zenigata. There's actually quite a few video game characters that were inspired by Zenigata. Unfortunately, I don't think we'll be getting an official Phoenix Wright Lupin crossover anytime soon, but we'll always have these storyboards and this ad for pachinko machines. Also, in one episode of Part 2, there is a background character that looks a bit like Phoenix Wright. I am not claiming that they ripped off a background character, that would be weird. I don't think anyone has ever done that. It's just a funny coincidence. 
like how there's a character that looks like Spike's beagle in part 3, and how in Bye Bye Liberty, Lupin briefly wears a shirt that looks like Steven Universe's shirt. Clarice created Moe. Many people have cited Clarice as the earliest example of Moe, or at least the progenitor of what would become Moe. If you don't know what Moe is, I will now read the Oxford Dictionary definition. In context of Japanese popular culture, Moe is the quality in a fictional female character of being youthful, innocent, and vulnerable in an idealized way, perceived as elicitating feelings of affection or protectiveness. After the release of The Castle of Cagliostro, Clarice was popular among some people. She became so popular that there were van scenes dedicated to her. Eventually, there were characters made inspired by her design, the most famous example being the main character from the Daikon Tree and Daikon 4 animations. These animations played at the Daikon invention in the 80s and were animated by the people who went on to create Studio Gainax, including Hideki Anno, you know, the Evangelion guy. And since we're bringing up Studio Gainax, Later on, characters like Rei from Evangelion and Hotaro from Sailor Moon were important characters that med Moe what it is today. There's even an Evangelion game where the player plays a self-insert nerve officer who takes care of Rei, and if you max out her otaku stat, you get an ending where the player character marries her and they're dressed up like Lupin and Clarice in a Cagliostro-themed wedding. Yeah, for some reason people uh, ship Lupin and Clarice. I don't get why, but they do. We have also come full circle. We now have Moe characters in Lupin the Third, including Ami, a character who is 15, is sexualized as soon as she's introduced, spends most of the anime having a crush on Lupin, and is a victim of child pornography. Can you tell I'm not a big fan of part five? Now Goemon's Moe. He's Moemon. If you want to learn more about Clarice and her connection to Moe, along with an analysis of Moe and Lollicon, I would highly recommend this article, The Castle of Doom and the Lollicon Boom. It's where I got most of my information, and it's an excellent read. Mamoru Oshii's cancelled Lupin movie. Oh boy, this one's a doozy. The Legend of the Gold of Babylon could have been a completely different movie. While Part 3 was airing, TMS went to Miyazaki to make another Lupin film. He declined as he was done with the franchise and he had moved on to pursue his own projects. But he did recommend Mamoru Oshii. Oshii and Yoshitaka Amano, one of the character designers from the Final Fantasy games, worked together to come up with a pitch. The first idea was to have a Lupin movie where you never see Lupin, but he would still have a presence throughout the movie. This eventually developed into Lupin is depressed having lost purpose in his life as there is nothing left in the world that's interesting to steal. Then he decides to steal an angel fossil that's located in the Tower of Babel in the middle of Tokyo. This tower was built by an architect. After the tower was completed, he committed suicide by jumping off the tower. While in the tower, the gang run into a little girl, who is the architect's granddaughter. According to an interview with Oshi, this was the girl's role. It seems she spends her life in a wheelchair, without making one step out of her room. A murder takes place in the tower, and the photographic evidence shows the white hands of a young girl. Lupin decides to tackle this mystery and sneaks into the tower. As he advances through the interior, he discovers white feathers scattered on the floor and the corpses of small animals. According to Fujiko's investigation, it turns out the girl wasn't the old architect's granddaughter. Then who in the world is she? She was actually an angel who mocked humans and killed them. In my mind, the tower itself was based on Dante's Inferno, while the strange girl was Beatrice. So mentioned in the above quote, Fujiko would have spent the movie investigating the angel fossil, kind of like a reporter. She would follow its location history, and she would eventually end up in the tower. She wouldn't even interact with the rest of the cast until the end of the movie, where she reveals the girl's true identity. When everyone gets to the fossil, they discover it's made of plutonium. Now I don't know in what order these events happen, but Lupin would have realized he's fictional. 
Tokyo would have been destroyed by a nuclear explosion caused by the angel fossil, and Lupin would have stolen reality. I think what would have happened was Lupin would realize he was fictional, therefore everyone and everything he knows is also fictional, and he would have just blown everything up because I guess nothing matters. Um, basically, the movie would have ended with the main character ceasing to exist. TMS thought these ideas were way too out there, so they fired Oshi and Amano, leaving only a handful of concept art. A lot of the ideas for the movie became Angel's Egg, including the little girl, and the fossil of what is implied to be an angel. By the way, Angel's Egg is good. Watch it if you haven't seen it. it it's on YouTube! The idea of the architect committing suicide after completing a project related to Christianity was reused for the first Pat Labor movie. Other ideas and concepts were used for the second Pat Labor movie and Ghost in the Shell. Kenji Kamiyama, a student of Oshi's, was heavily influenced by the themes of this cancelled movie and used some of them for the Re-Cyborg 9 movie. Even The Legend of Gold of Babylon, the movie that would replace this project, has a strange character that's more than they appear to be. Instead of a little girl turning out to be an angel, it was an old woman turning out to be an alien. This project is just so fascinating, and seeing how much movies it influenced is insane. Years later, some people still think about and talk about this cancelled movie. In 2005, a Japanese website made an April Fool's joke about Oshi directing a TV special, and they posted an image of Lupin in an art style similar to Ghost in the Shell. Like Miyazaki, Oshi wondered, what would it be like if Lupin wasn't a static character, and how would he develop as he gets older? Miyazaki's interpretation of this was Cagliostro, having Lupin in his twilight years. He's a bit nicer and a bit more mature. I think that this movie would have been Lupin going through a midlife crisis. That's why Oshi's Lupin concept in this magazine looks like he's balding. It's meant to be a much older Lupin. It's a very fascinating idea. Though it will never happen, it would be interesting for someone to explore this. Apparently Hideki Anno was going to be an animator for this if it was greenlit. And of course, with the movie dealing with a depressed main character, having a lot of Christian symbolism, angels, reality just getting completely messed up. I can't help but think of Evangelion. Could you imagine a Lupin Evangelion? That would be insane! White Jacket Originally, Yozo Akoi, the animation supervisor, character designer, and animator for Part 3, wanted Lupin's jacket to be white for Part 3. TMS wanted to be red just like in Part 2. They compromised with pink. Also, Monkey Punch once drew Lupin with a white jacket, and I have an unofficial example of white jacket this bootleg. Can we have this be the color scheme for part 7 or a random special? Please give me bright lime green Jigen. Yellow Jacket. Hisashi Iguchi, the character designer for the TV special Voyage to Danger, suggested making Lupin's jacket yellow. He even met some concept art for it, but the request was ignored. I like this color scheme. We were robbed. Jigen reads Barazuku magazines. Barazoku was Japan's first circulated gay men's magazines. And in one of the episodes of Part 3, you see Jigen reading a magazine that resembles Barazoku. It's even called Playboys, it's pretty clear what it is. This section can be summed up as Jigen is gay, and I will go into more detail about this. Throughout the entire series, Jigen has a lack of interest in women. In the Kabuki episode, Jigen says this. <laughs> This is a term that is historically associated with gay men in Japan. In the dub, it was translated into this. My reputation for misogyny is legendary. Since the term directly translates into woman hater in English, Lupin and Jigen are very close. This kind of subtext is even in the manga. I could go on, but this video is long enough already. I will link this article that examines the gay subtext in Lupin the Third. It only covers part one, but it's still a good read. Lupin and Jigen getting crushed in Yasuo Atsuka's book. Pretty self-explanatory. In one of Yasuo's art books, there's a bunch of vehicles in Lupin artwork, and one of these artworks has a Fiat getting crushed by a tank. Oh no, Jigen's hat is there, implying that the two were crushed to death. Nasudo. 
So what is Nasudo? Well, Nasudo was a manga that was in Shonen Jump for 17 issues in the 1970s. The series had a short run since the premise and Nasudo's design was similar to Lupin, and Shonen Jump was worried about legal issues. So, how similar was Nasudo's design to Lupin's? They look exactly the same. They're the same picture. I have seen this image before, and I assumed it was just early Lupin art, where he looks a bit different, like this one where he got a big nose and a longer head. And not a completely different character? Really, the only difference between Nasudo and Lupin is that Nasudo has a white jacket and an N on his tie. The premise is Nasudo, who is a thief, him and his partner Scott, who looks a lot like Jigen, just without the hat, and his surrogate daughter Chico steals things and hijinks ensue. Nasudo is a mystery. The chapters haven't been reprinted for legal reasons, and even if they were around, they haven't been translated into English yet. I am really curious about Nasudo. I really want to read it. I need the context of Chico cutting off Nasudo's toes. Even the author is a mystery. Kano Banko, I have an image of him here. Other than that, I don't really know anything about him. Apparently, that's not even his real name. It's Kano Satoru. And other than Natsudo, his utter work is porn manga. I feel like that, like myself, there may have been people who have seen Nasudo but assumed it was Lupin. Well, all we can say now is put Nasudo in the next Jump Force game, you cowards! Hey, thanks for watching the video. Uh, normally people would plug things, but I make videos as a hobby. So I'd like to recommend other Lupin content that you could watch. Shannon Strutchy has done a non-spoiler review on the first. There's also Carrie Bukun's video on I've watched all of Lupin the third and regretted it. Last but not least, we have Is Lupin Still Flirting, a free-to-play visual novel. You play as Lupin, who's been captured by Zenigata, and you have to flirt your way to freedom. So, the day I was about to upload this video, I found out that there is another Lupin Iceberg meme that has over 30 things I did not cover in this video. And honestly, the idea of going back and adding all of that stuff, I kind of felt like this, so I'm just going to leave the video as is. But don't worry, the creator of the iceberg plans on making their own video covering their own iceberg, so you're covered. So whenever that comes out, I recommend that you watch it.